So my name is Marissa Town. I am first and foremost a person living with type 1 diabetes for 34 years. Uh, I am also a nurse and a CDCES or diabetes educator or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I have two different roles. I work at Children with Diabetes as a nonprofit, and I work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. These are the people that fund Children with Diabetes. They don't directly pay me, but I figured I'd disclose it. So this is a very interesting topic, and it really took me a long time to decide how I was going to talk about this. So uh, the first point is very obvious, and this is kind of like kindergarten, so just bear with me. And I know that you all here are probably extraordinarily engaged and empathetic humans, um, but I'm going to go ahead and give you this talk this way anyway, in case you want to use it for maybe persuading your peers. So first of all, we are all human. I know, again, kindergarten. But one of the key aspects of being human is autonomy. And when people are enabled and empowered to have autonomy related to their health care, we assume that the outcomes will be better. And I, I mean, I can imagine that if I have the autonomy to make decisions, I'm going to feel better about what I'm doing. So as an example, I'd like everyone in the room to please stand up. OK. We're almost there. We're getting there. We're getting there. If you have a mobility issue, I apologize. Um, now, I want everyone who didn't want to stand up when I asked you to, to please sit down. Be honest. Do you see why autonomy matters? Okay, you can all sit down. You also can remain standing if you feel more comfortable. So I use this as a very poignant example of, of diabetes management. So what would you do if someone picked your groceries for you? You had no input in this decision and they picked your groceries for you every week. They chose the types of foods, the different variations. They didn't consider your allergies, what equipment you have at your place that you live. Do they know better than you what you should be eating? Maybe. Do they know if you know how to even handle these foods? You know, my sister's a dietitian and she brings things home like faro. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do with that. Okay. You'd have to make the best of it. And you would, but would you be happy about it? I don't know. I want you to think about how that would feel. Knowledge versus wisdom. So this is one of my favorite quotes. So knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit and wisdom is not putting it into fruit salad. When you may, you may know what's best for someone. That may very well be true. But when they, when you suggest something without even considering the input of the human that's going to be required to do all the work on the end, their end, it doesn't lend itself to good outcomes. Do you think someone else in your life really knows what's best for you? So why would you think that you know best for someone else? And will you listen? So when I, I gave a similar talk at ISPAD in Rotterdam, and it was hilarious because I could not have paid this gentleman enough money to do what he did. I asked this guy to stand up it's because I told him, listen, I know where you're supposed to be sitting. And he completely ignored me. And that's the exact point. If you have someone that's telling you, well, well, you need to exercise, you need to do this, and they're not taking into consideration your social determinants of health, your mental status, like what if you're just overwhelmed at work and with being a parent, like they have no consideration. You're not going to listen to that person. You are going to completely tune out. You are going to completely, completely miss the boat with your patients if this is the way that you're doing things. Oh, I went, I went too fast. So. My tip number one is to listen and empower. This seems obvious, but sometimes we all get into this routine of, you know, being concerned about the uploads, looking at the CGM tracing, doing all the things that we have to do, because I know that you are rushed. I know that you can't spend the amount of time with your patients and families that you want to, but we really have to step one, listen, and make sure you're encouraging your peers. So this is something that, you know, all of us in this room are, are privileged to be here, right? 
And I recognize that I have a lot of privilege as a white woman, right? But if I don't stand up for the issues for people that don't feel comfortable standing up for them, I am doing them a huge disservice. And this is my ask to you. I know that it's not comfortable always to call people out. For example, when people are using terms like non-compliant that make me want to bang my head against a wall. Um, when people are saying things that you know mean that they are not considering the human, that they are judging that person. I want you to please, please try to summon the courage to say, Hey, you know, that's not really the way that we do things anymore. You know, we don't, we don't consider compliant, a, a, a valid term in diabetes, because as you heard earlier today, insulin is the only thing that we're using currently to manage type one diabetes. And we know that that's not the only challenge. I, someone mentioned at a conference in uh, Nas at the National Institutes of Health that diabetes is kind of like dark matter or the universe. Like we just discovered, I guess, I don't, I don't know, the space people in Houston will know this, that we only know 15% about our universe. It's similar with type one diabetes. We know some, we know enough to keep people alive, but expecting perfection is impossible. And by listening to people, telling them that their voice matters, you're telling them that their experience matters. So if you're trying to get people to be advocates for themselves, they have to feel like they matter. And then of course, in the words of Kendrick Lamar, sit down, be humble. And if you haven't heard that song, I encourage you to listen. <laughs> so at ISPAD, Dr. Laya Eklesbauer from UCSF presented this data about CGM in newly diagnosed children. And this is something that's a new policy, right? And I, it's hard to see. I apologize. I didn't get the slides from her in time. But parents were saying, I'm really ready for this at the beginning. And there was a lot of concern from a variety of healthcare professionals that we were going to be one, de-skilling people, and two, you know, not create like giving them anxiety by giving them access to all those numbers at once. Like I've heard a lot of reasons why people were concerned about prescribing them. Some of it is provider time related, which I totally understand, but people really wanted it, right? And in this talk, someone asked, well, is she also presented data about AID at diagnosis, which is a whole new uh, next step, right? And someone asked, well, well, what are we, why would we do that? What if they, what if something happens? And, and the, the response that Laya gave, which is something that I need to credit Dr. Sue Brown with, she said that this was Sue's idea, is when we start someone on MDI, it's not like we just give them Lantus or, you know, a basal insulin, we give them both, right? This is the same kind of concept. It's just changing the construct of what we're thinking. And again, just a reminder to listen to people. So these are some responses to a study about people who didn't have access to uh, technologies or in their diagnosis until later on. So, you know, yeah, I just got offered that recently. Never before I've had it for over a year and a half and I didn't know the technology existed. I didn't have a choice. I don't, I, as to why I didn't get it, I couldn't have it because my blood sugar or I, yeah, because my blood sugar was always high. And I've heard multiple talks today where people are addressing this issue. And I just want to say thank you and kudos. Thank you. And again, this is the doctor said, if I was just more responsible, then he would like me to get the pump. So when it comes to the wider population, which is where my work at Cincinnati Children's is, is getting things into the hands of people that are the highest risk, quote unquote, people with the most social determinants of health and the most challenges to achieving their goals. The thing is, is that the AID systems really do work for this population, you know, and it's kind of like, if you want, if you're worried about them, you're, they're going to be, they're going to struggle no matter what they're on. So you might as well give them the best tools to achieve at least some glycemic control. And then this is my shout out to Dr. Laya and Sue Brown. Oop. And so this is a quote from my dad who's sitting in this room, which is hilarious. Um, so my dad is Jeff Hitchcock who founded Children with Diabetes, which is a nonprofit organization. And the reason that I feel so comfortable being outspoken with my concerns. Um, so his quote is life is lived off label. 
diabetes doesn't follow the rules. So how can we stay in this very black and white construct of rules with diabetes? We just can't. It won't play the game. Things to consider, you know, wearing CGM wherever it's going to fit on the body and wherever it's going to stick, right? You know, within reason, like, listen, I'm a reasonable human, be safe. Um, insulin pump and CGM by age. Again, like, why would you withhold tools that could be extremely helpful? Now, if there's like weight limitations and you can't get the basal down low enough, we've had that experience and I totally understand, but arbitrary numbers, I don't think make sense in this condition. There are people buying expired supplies or using the diabetes black market as it's commonly called, because you have to do what you have to do. And I'm not saying that you need to support it, but I just want you to know that it's happening and it's going to keep happening as long as healthcare access is an issue. And then considering using other adjunctive medications, which again, this is a great group to talk to about this, but just remembering that it's not, it's not black and white. So our lives are in your hands and we know it. You control our access to medications, to devices, you control whether or not we feel supported or whether we feel shame and blame related to our condition. You control our access to everything. What if we need FMLA to get to our visits? What if we need, and this is, this is my story for you. So driver's license forms. This is a great story. You're going to love it. Oh my gosh. So I have seen for years, this gentleman who is a primary care physician that lives with type one diabetes himself. And he required me to come back yearly to get this form filled out that says, despite having diabetes, I am a safe human to drive a car. So I switched doctors to this primary care doctor because I didn't like having to drive across town to see this guy. And like, he was fine, but not great. Okay. And this guy who knows nothing about me, but is a nice provider said, do you know that there's a box on here that I can check that I never have to fill this form out again? And I'm like, are you effing kidding me? So like, don't hold us hostage, right? Like, I mean, I understand being concerned if you've had severe hypoglycemia and you've crashed your car, that didn't happen with me. Like, why are you holding me hostage? And then resources. We at Children with Diabetes host an event called Friends for Life, which is something kind of like this or kind of like ADA, but for families living with diabetes. And the whole goal is to provide education, support, and empowerment. And for some time, people would say, well, you know, they would tell their families, oh, don't go there because we don't want you to come back knowing more than we know. Like what a statement to make. Like, I understand that you want to feel comfortable, but I, like, we're the ones driving this ship. So please don't withhold these things. And again, if you see people doing that, please encourage them to have a little bit more empathy. You can send them to me. I'll talk to them. Uh, so tip two, don't stand in the way. When people ask for things, consider it, discuss it, do your best to help them get it. Don't be the gatekeeper. And I heard someone say that yesterday and I just really appreciate it. I don't remember who you were, but thank you for that comment. And if there are contraindications, which does happen, find an alternative that helps them achieve their goal. And this goes back to the Kendrick Lamar, sit down, be humble. Um, if you don't know how to support them, refer them to a colleague. Like this is not a competition, which is what's such a beautiful thing about this group. Like we are all in this together and we need to utilize our resources within the community. So this might be, I don't know, maybe it's easier to read for you, but these are some percentages of people that have uh, experienced stigma and it, the orange or yellow color is for type one diabetes. And then the blue is for type two diabetes. And this is just a point that I want to hammer in is we experience so much stigma every day and it can be really frustrating. So just keeping that in mind with the language that you're using with your families and your people living with diabetes and a plug for destigmatize.org. If you have questions, check out that website. And then I'm going to hopefully play this video maybe.
for people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem? Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh, just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. You know, John, be shopping it's so bad. Shared- of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try less challenging, Major. Wow, what are dreams? And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. So I use that and I know that it was mostly about racism because, and I think we should be talking about racism. So just going to slide that in there, but because diabetes stigma is, is not the same, but similar when you consider the mosquito bite analogy, you know, it may not seem like a big deal if you're asking someone like, oh, I thought you had good glucose control or something like that. But when we hear that all the time, that might be what gets you snapped at. So as that consideration, your tip number three, your language use really matters and acknowledge the challenges with stigma that people experience, because even if you're not saying it, we're hearing it from other people. Avoid stigmatizing language behaviors and examine your own beliefs and biases. And this goes beyond diabetes, of course. I'm asking you to think about this for every bias and belief that you have, because we all have them. We are all human and we are not infallible. Do your homework. If you're not familiar with the ADCES language guidelines, please check it out. And then I have a quote from Maya Angelou who here, where it's people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Okay, and these are some uh, examples of my CGM tracings at various times in the last few months. And this is me as a person who's lived with type one for 34 years, as a registered nurse, as a clinical diabetes care and education specialist, I am like one of the most trained people maybe to manage glucose levels and I cannot get it right all the time, right? And I am well-resourced and well-supported. I have, my dad started a freaking diabetes nonprofit. I mean, if I can't do it all the time, like no one can. So just remind that, remind yourself of the expectations that you're holding for others. This, I don't know if it's showing up very well, but, uh, so my son is 10 and during my pregnancy, I had to log my blood sugars for 37 weeks, even though I was wearing a Dexcom because they didn't trust the Dexcom. They didn't know it. They wanted me to switch to a Medtronic pump because that's what they knew how to use. I was wearing Animus. It was a blast, but I show this and I hope it shows up where you can see the ridiculous numbers that they circled right? Like they would circle when I was over 120 and it would be like 122. And I'm like, really, really? That's what we're going to talk about today. So just again, sit down, be humble. Maybe that should have been my title of my talk. Um, So tip four, acknowledge the suck. Like diabetes just sucks. Okay. It's obviously difficult and complicated. Otherwise we would not be in this room today. We wouldn't have diabetes care and education specialists. They don't have this kind of stuff for other conditions, like some maybe, but not to the the depth that we have in this specialty. So acknowledge that it's something that we're learning about and it's impossible to achieve perfection. And I encourage those of you with diabetes in the room to also share this with your patients and families. Like it starts with us saying, I can't do it right all the time, 
Like we need to not be, it needs to be, it's like the Instagram versus reality. Like we need to show the reality and the reality is the suck, unfortunately. Um, and then encourage people to meet other people with diabetes. You know, this is something that we hear again and again. And, and when, if I'm trying to advise you on how to teach people to be self-advocates, they need to have peer support because they need to hear from other people like that. Yes, we acknowledge the suck. It's impossible. We need someone to celebrate the wins with and, you know, discuss the challenges with. So send them to camps, support groups, friends for life conferences, anything that you can do to connect them with other people with diabetes will help. Remind people with diabetes that they know their diabetes best and encourage them to speak up with other healthcare professionals or providers who don't understand or are less inclined to listen. And I think, you know, it's really starts with empowering and validating people's feelings. Like that's going to be like step one in becoming an advocate for yourself because they have to know that their feelings matter. And then just a reminder that everyone has their own unique journey with diabetes and it changes across the lifespan. Some days I'm like, this is fine. I got this. And other days I'm like, oh. so it's okay. Acknowledge that, let them have those feelings. And what I try to recommend is encouraging people to own their diabetes so it doesn't own them. And then from an advocacy perspective, perspective. Another Maya Angelou quote is every time a woman stands up for herself without knowing it, possibly without claiming it, she stands up for all women. So this is where, again, my call to action for everyone in this room is to please stand up to us, to your peers. Please ask them to stop using the word diabetic, to stop using the word non-compliant for the love of God. Just remember the power that your voice has because you really do have the power to help us make this culture change. And again, connections with other people. So tip five, empower and support people with diabetes. Encourage them to seek out events and provide resources for mental health and wellness when they're struggling. So here's my summary. Tip one, listen and empower. Tip two, don't stand in the way. Tip three, your language use really matters. Tip four, acknowledge the suck. You could say challenge if you wanted to. Uh, tip five, empower and support people with diabetes. And above all, have compassion for yourself and others. Like I fully acknowledge that it's not like every day we get up and do everything perfectly, right? So you're not gonna do this right every time either. And that's okay. But as long as you have the intent and you're trying, I appreciate you. And just a reminder that at the end of the day, 99.98% of the time, we are managing our diabetes on our own. And those are my kids. Thank you for listening. And I think we have time for questions. I know I'm like between you and lunch. Do we have time? I mean, you can also go eat. I'm not offended. Again, I believe in choice. Yeah. And that's something that I struggle with as well. Right. Because, you know, I think what you need to do, and this is what I try to do is find out what people's goals are, right? Like, what is your goal? And like, I, what I do is I explain my goal is to think about my diabetes less, right? I want something working for me in the background to make my diabetes easier because I work two jobs. I have two kids. I ain't nobody got time for that. Right. So my, if you talk about it from that perspective, hyper closed loop systems are the only way to make that with at least it's the best way to make diabetes suck less and have the systems and technologies working in the background to alleviate some of the burden. Does that make sense? Mm 
Yeah. No. Yes. No, I completely agree. And I actually took a pump break at the beginning of this year, not from um, anything else, but clearing up scar tissue. Uh, but it is important to support people in their own diabetes journey. And and I do think that's another part of presenting the the devices is like, this doesn't have to be forever. It's not like, you know, I don't know, a tattoo. It's not like a tattoo. Hey, Marissa, and thank you so much for a very refreshing talk. This is great. Appreciate you. Um, so my question, um, when you, we talk about empower, empowerment, um, as a pediatric endocrinologist, a lot of times this person I'm speaking to is the parent. So um, I appreciate you being so open about your experiences um, and how you are, who you are today. So maybe this might be more a question for Jeff, but talk a little bit about what do you think is the most positive parenting style that we can encourage in our parents? Um, because you know, in the end, the child is actually our patient, but it's the parent we're actually communicating with. Yeah. And I want to make, I want to make two comments about that. I want number one, I think acknowledging the challenges of being a caregiver of someone with diabetes is incredibly important and supporting the parents or caregivers in their own mental health needs is super important. And I think, you know, and he'll talk next, this is kind of fun. Um, but one of the things that my parents did is there was never any, so he's a math major, my dad. Okay. So numbers are numbers, right? It's data and it's, there's not a lot of emotion attached to it, which I know is so hard because, you know, if you look like, I'm so glad I'm the one with diabetes. If my kid had a blood sugar of 400, I would be really worried. But my parents were like, listen, like you're 400. Now, what do we do next? Instead of, oh my God, what'd you do? What'd you eat? How many cookies did you have? You know, yeah. To echo that, my wife and I made a, a commitment that you could never be punished for diabetes. Numbers are just numbers, as Marissa said. And I think we took that from a very good diagnosis experience. Those words don't often get strung together. Um, we saw a pediatric endocrinologist, <clears throat> excuse me, named Alan Glasgow at Washington, D.C.'s Children's Hospital. And in September of 89, before the DCCT was published, he said, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. And sometimes that's all that parents need to hear, right? And that's the power too of meeting, like honestly, me existing as an adult with diabetes and meeting parents sometimes is like a simple enough acknowledgement of you can grow up and be healthy. And like, I'm so lucky, knock on wood, my complication is maybe cavities. Like you could maybe say that when I'm low in the middle of the night and I don't like squirt the juice backs enough in the back of my mouth, like, you know. Yeah. yeah but, and, and again, to echo this, you all will meet families on the hardest day of their life. Just remember Alan's message to me. Thanks, dad. Oh, and that's it. Thank you all so much. Oh, wait, do you want to? I don't know. I'm getting the. Okay. Follow one, so. okay. Oh, but thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for all that you do. I know endocrinology is underappreciated. I appreciate you. Thank you.